Man, I, I am so glad to be here with you guys. It's a holiday weekend. In addition to it being five degrees, it's a holiday weekend. Martin Luther King, you know, holiday coming up here. And, you know, I kind of wonder, when you think about Martin Luther King, what's one of the first things that comes to your mind? I have a dream. I have a dream, right? How many of you guys have a dream of some sort? Yeah, some sort. You know, what's interesting about that, that speech is so famous so powerful. Uh, he had a dream of something great coming true. And you can see the fruits of his efforts still today. And, um, and it's very cool. But that particular phrase in the speech wasn't in the speech um, in his original rendition. It was late in the game, almost uh, just a few hours before that speech was delivered that that came to him. And he modified the speech almost on the fly. And that became one of, the, one of the things he's most noted for, right? I have a dream. Now, I want you to think about him as a person. Now, I'm not talking... Some of you guys, now let me just... Don't go CNN on me. And don't go Fox News on me. Don't do either one. Just stay right here. Let's talk about Jesus. And let's talk about... Let's talk about his kingdom. Let's talk about his kingdom advancing. Let's talk about Jesus' dream for the world. Let's talk about what he did in the world and what he wanted to do in the world. And the kind of people that God has chosen to advance his kingdom. There's a particular kind of person that gets the work of God done in the world. And this is what I like about Martin Luther King Jr. He was that kind of person because he was relentless. Last week I touched on a verse that said the kingdom of God advances through forceful people. Now I'm not talking, when, it, when we talk about force, we're not talking about being violent or, or being political. We're talking about people who people who are on a mission to change the world for the better because of Christ. Now, as that advances, that means sometimes you come against hard times, but you don't stop, right? The thing that made him who he is is that he would not stop. He was relentless. Let me ask you, how are you, how are you at being relentless? Are you relentless in the pursuit of your dream? Or do you quit too soon sometimes? Are you relentless? Do you keep going do you keep moving forward even when it's tough? Or do you stop short sometimes? Which one are you? Are you more likely to quit? Or are you more likely to keep going? Which kind of person are you? In this series, The Last Era, Erwin McManus is writing the book, and I think his primary drive is to help us become people who don't quit too soon. Because the reality is most of us in our culture, we quit too soon. When we hit opposition, we quit. Martin Luther King Jr., if he had hit some opposition and quit, would we know his name today? If he had hit, when he had opposition, if he had quit, would you know who he was today? It certainly wouldn't be a holiday named after him. You would never remember that speech because that speech never would have been given because he would have quit long before he got to those steps, long before he stood in that place and delivered that speech and he had that dream that the world took part in. If he had quit, no one would know who he was. And friends... This is why I'm excited about this series. This is why I'm excited that you're here. God brought you here today for this message. And for those of you online, he's got you here listening online for this reason today. And it is this. He's calling you to become a person who's relentless. A person who does not quit too soon. A person who keeps on even when life is tough. Even when you've got news that's hard. Even when people stand in opposition to you. Even when you're health mocks you, whatever it is that you face, whatever challenge you face, God is saying to you, don't quit. Don't give up too soon. You're big enough. You're strong enough for the journey ahead. You have enough courage in you for what you're going to face. This is the core of the message that I want to get into today. Uh, but I want to start with this passage that, that really the book centers on. And it's, it's in 2 Kings and it's chapter 13. And, uh, and, and the, the big headline is that the man of God, the prophet of God, a guy named Elisha, was mad at King Joash. And this is the context of it. I'm going to just kind of tell you the story instead of read you the text today. Because I think it will help us more. Julie, will you hand me those arrows right there? I forgot those. Thank you, babe. So the storyline is this. Elisha is near death. King Joash calls him to the palace. And kings in that time needed men of God, needed, needed prophets of God to, to help them in ruling over their kingdoms. It was important to know what the will of God was in a magnificent way because, because 
your, your kingdom would rise or fall based on what God was up to. And they knew it very well. Sometimes we forget that today, don't we? That our little kingdoms, we think that we can make them rise or fall. We really cannot. What happens mostly is up to God. But, it, but it's interesting that God also allows us to participate in what happens in the world. So in this, in this passage, King Joash calls Elisha to his side because Elisha is dying. And everyone knows he's near death. King Joash is concerned about what's going to happen to his kingdom. So the prophet tells, tells the king, listen, get, get a bow and get some arrows. And I want, you, I want you to take that bow and I want you to shoot this arrow out into, out through that window. I said, open the window. Yeah, put that apple on your head, brother. You ready? And, and he said, shoot. And he shot the, shot the arrow out the window. And the prophet said, this is what it's going to be like. You're going to, you're going to have victory far out into the future. And you're going to strike Aphek. And they're going to fall. And then he says to the king, he says, now, I want you to do this. Take some arrows. And the king took some arrows. He said, strike the ground. And the king struck it three times. And he stopped. This is where the passage gets weird. The prophet is mad at him. It's, the, the text tells us the, the prophet, the man of God, was mad at the king. Why was he mad at the king? Because he stopped. The prophet said, you shouldn't have stopped. He was mad at him because he stopped with three. He said, you should have struck the, you should have struck the ground five or six times. You should have kept striking because if you would have kept striking, then you would have defeated Aphek, it would have totally been over. But because you stopped, you're always going to be at war. Here's the principle. Some of you, some of us, are facing challenges in our life. And we dibble-dabble. And we, we strike it three times and we quit. We strike it three times and we quit. We strike it one time and we quit. We strike it two times and we quit. We quit, we quit, we quit. We quit more than we keep going. And we're constantly in a war against this challenge that we're facing. And I don't know what the challenge is in your life, but you're facing something. If you have a dream of doing anything, you will face challenges. And those challenges will cause you to want to quit. But the message from last week, this is the kind of the starting blocks for today, is man, don't quit. The man of God was mad because the king quit. You see, it's a, the, the trouble was, it wasn't just that the king quit on that time. It was that the king was a quitter. He had become a person who quit everything too soon. It was a character flaw. Now, this isn't something that you have to live with. You don't have to continue to be a quitter if you've been a quitter. You can, you can overcome quitting. You see, average people quit too soon. And average people die with their quivers full of arrows. That's what happens to average people. Now the reality is we're all average at most things. Most things were average. But there are a few things that God has put in your quiver. There are a few things that God has given you that are uniquely yours that he sent you to use to change the world. There's a few things that he's given you and your set of, of, the, of what's in your quiver, of what he's given you to do battle in the world, of what he's given you to change the world. There's a few things where you are not average. But the only way to overcome being average is to become a person who will not quit too soon. And this, my friends, is in your control. This is up to you. This is not up to God. Sometimes we blame God for things in our lives that we haven't overcome. We say, well, God didn't deliver me. No, no, no. God wants to deliver you, but he also allows you to participate in your own rescue. So that means sometimes it is that you become a person who, yes, has faith in God and what he can do, but you also must do the work. I'll give you a real live illustration. Okay, our parking lot. Yesterday, if the parking lot had been cleared at 9 o'clock in the morning and, put, and had salt put on it, then the sun and the salt and the person clearing the parking lot would have worked together and we would have had a nice clean parking lot. All right? So was, 
Was it God's will that the parking lot be clear this morning or not? I really don't know. <laughs> I guess not. I guess not. However, however, our parking lot clearing dude didn't make it till almost three o'clock. So he, he cleared it and he put ice or he put uh, salt on it. He could have put ice on it the way it looks. But anyway, the, so it's not clear. And the reason it's not clear is because because we didn't we didn't get ahead of it soon enough. We didn't give the elements that God has already put in place: sun and salt, phos and halos coming together to clear the parking lot. We didn't give it enough time to do its work. So, is it on God or on us? The parking lot's not clear. I'll say more specifically on me. Partially on me. This is the harsh truth. I probably have to fire the dude that was doing our parking lot and get somebody else. Because he didn't do what, this is twice. You see what I'm saying? So sometimes we have to decide, is it, is it on me? Is it on God? Is it on both of us? Is God trying to stop me? No, many times it's not that God is stopping us, but many times it's that we've chosen to be average. You see, average is about crabs in a bucket. You know about crabs in a bucket, right? Crabs in a bucket work this way. This is the legend of crabs in a bucket. If you put one crab in a bucket, it will crawl out. If you put two crabs in a bucket, neither of them will get out. Why? Because every, every time one of them tries to get out, what does the other one do? Grabs it and pulls it back, right? Because nobody wants you to be above average. If you're asking the world for permission to climb out of your bucket, they're never going to give you permission. They're never going to look at you and say, oh, you go get them, dude, unless they're also someone who climbed out of their bucket. You see, somebody that want to get out of your bucket, you need to find other people that climbed out of their bucket already who overcame the odds and became different. They became bucket barrier breaker people who are no longer just content to stay at the bottom of the bucket with the other crabs, but that's different. By definition, you break the law of average. So today I want to give you, I want to tell you what the law of average is, and I want to tell you how to break the law of average. Would that be all right? If I share with you how to break the law of average, because um, the reality is, is that, that there's some areas in your life you really need to break the law of average, not just for your sake. I'm not talking about you building a better kingdom. I'm talking about you making the world a better place, the way Martin Luther King Jr. made the world a better place because he refused to quit. He refused to be average because average never would have stood on those steps. Average would have never delivered that speech. Average never would have gotten the job done. Average would have quit. And God has something he wants you to do in your life. He has something he wants to do in you, for you, and through you that can change somebody else's life, that can change the world. But you have to become a person who won't accept being average because average are people who quit too soon. So let's look at some of what the law of averages says. The law of averages basically says to you, this is, what, this is the voice that whispers into your ear and it says, you are not enough. You are not good enough. You are not powerful enough. You are just average. You're just average. And it even says things to you like this. It says, it says don't stand out or make, or make a scene. Just, be, just stay small. Now, I want to talk to the women here for just a minute. Listen to me. Culturally, this is not a stereotype that I have, but this is a stereotype our culture has. Culturally, listen to me. You are far more likely to quit than the men are. Because culturally, even today, as free as our society is, there's still a bit of a stigma about you achieving your highest level of success. It's important for you not to accept average just because you have ovaries. Okay? Make sense? It's you too are called. You too are there. Now, I'm going a little bit overboard on this because my daughter is one who faces the same challenge and you try to help her achieve, rise above that. Don't settle for that. Go on. Become who you were called to be. And you, all, all of us, guys too, without ovaries, still need to achieve, okay? Okay, so um, a voice that's in our head because if you've quit before, this is where it really gets dangerous. If you've ever quit something before, then, then, then you label yourself as a quitter. And the voice says something like this. Go ahead and quit because you 
are a quitter. And you've got that label. Friends, reach back there. Take that label and tear it off. Throw it in the garbage can. You can choose today to stop quitting. You can choose today to quit quitting. And wouldn't it be a good day if you, if you decided today is the day you're going to quit quitting? If today you decided, you know what? I'm going to push through the barriers. I'm going to push through what's holding me back. I'm not going to be just another crab in the bucket. I'm not going to settle for being at the bottom of the bucket with a bunch of other crabs. Here's another thing we say to ourselves. You're a hot mess. You've always been a hot mess. You're just messed up. You just can't ever get anything right. Um, it, might, it might sound something like this. You'll never amount to anything just like so-and-so said about you. You see, I'll put a blank. If you're following along in the Sermon Note app, you'll see there's a blank there. Right there is a good time for you to remember to write in the name of someone who said about you, you're never going to amount to anything. There's a person in Corbin, Kentucky, whose name I won't use for fear that she might hear this sermon someday somehow. But I want to thank her for my degree from the University of Kentucky. Because I came from a little bitty high school in southeastern Kentucky, graduated with 86 people. Went to the same school building from the time I was in kindergarten to 12th grade. Very rare. Really kind of beautiful, honestly. However, a friend's mom who, who knew me said, oh, he went to Lynn Camp. That's the name of the school. It's named after a mining camp that used to be there. He went to that school. He'll never make it at UK. So guess what? Every time I wanted to hit quit at UK, guess what? I used that as fuel. I'm like, yeah, we'll see. And I wanted to quit all the time. My freshman year, I wanted to quit more than I wanted to stay. I wanted to be gone more than I wanted to be there because it was really hard. And I had missed a lot of stuff. My high school didn't offer the classes that so many of my peers had. I, my peers coming in from Louisville schools and places like Oldham County, they had all kinds of classes and coursework under their belt. And when they hit there and they started their freshman classes, it was a whole lot easier for them than it was for me. But I would be dead before I would, before I would quit because of what she said. So thank you, Miss So-and-so, for saying that I couldn't do it. And it's time for some of you to take that same approach. If somebody said that about you, are you going to take it? You're going to live, you're going to live under the thumb of what they said about you? You must choose. Will you rise above what they said? Or will you live into what they said? Will you become a barrier breaker? Or will you stay in the bottom of the bucket with the other crabs? Because what crabs do, they want you to quit. They want you to stop. They want you to dig in and just quit. Or maybe the voice says something like this. Uh, you're, you're just like your old man, your old woman. You're never going to amount to anything. You're going to wind up just like them. He's going to be just like them. And in some cases, this is a good thing. Some of you have cases where it's not a good thing. If it's a good thing, good for you. Live toward who they are. In my case, I have that. I have parents who are amazing. and <laughs> It's tough to live up to who they are and were. Um, I've, so I've got something to live into, and some of you do too. Some of you have, have parents that you have to overcome. I don't know which it is. But either way, you have to become this type of person that doesn't quit. Okay? Uh, and then this is, this is the statement that you hear in your mind. This is the one, you are just average. Now that's a true and a false statement. Here's the reality. Let's just embrace it. At most things, you are average. And no matter how hard you try, no matter how hard you work, you are not going to be above average in some areas. Matter of fact, in some areas, you're below average. So let's all take a deep breath and say, okay, in some areas... I'm below average. For instance, the NBA has not called me in the past six weeks about drafting me for any team. I don't know why. I mean, look at this. Come on. I mean, what NBA team wouldn't want this on their floor? You know what I'm talking about. Okay? They're not recruiting me because I'm below average in several categories they, they must have. And uh, you just can't teach height. I don't have it. Nor do I have a massive wingspan. Um, and let's not talk about other areas where I, like, I can't jump. So, um, so anyway, so there's just things that, that I'm just not there. I just don't have what it takes. 
for their team. So I'm average, exit, below average in some categories they need you to be above average in. But there are some things in life that I can do that nobody else can do. There are, there are a few things, a few arrows that God has given me that only I can do. And you know what? It's the same for you. In a lot of ways, you're average. In most ways, you're average. In some ways, you're below average. But in a few things, with a few arrows, or maybe even just one, maybe it's just one, you are way above average. Statistically, psychologists tell us that you are better than 10,000 other people at something. What is your something? What is the gift you were meant to bring to the world? And why haven't you brought it yet? The world is waiting for you to do your thing, but you have been quitting by choice, not by God's will. So will you take that quiver with that arrow and will you shoot that arrow and trust that God will bring you another? Will you shoot and strike and continue to go forward even when it's tough? Or will you quit? The first rule of not quitting, how to break the law of average is this. You gotta crash through your quitting points. You gotta go right through them. You, you, you think you should stop, you think you should quit, but that's a mental barrier, it's not real, it's not really there. And even, I gotta be honest with you, sometimes you're all wrapped up and worried about what other people are thinking about you. I have some very important news to give you today. They are not thinking about you. They are thinking about what you're thinking about them. So this is kind of weird, right? You think you stop because you're worried about what they're gonna think about you. Well, guess what, they ain't thinking about you, they're thinking about them and what you're thinking about them. The weird circle, it's like a dog chasing his tail kind of thing. So let's just stop the game. Respect them, love them, care for them, forgive them if you must, but you go on and live your dream. Go on and do what you're supposed to do. Go on and bring your difference to the world. Right, Mary Bronis? Make your difference. This woman has a powerful teaching gift, and guess what? She's going to unleash it here at Fos in the months ahead. It's going to be really cool to see what God does in her through and for it. She's already been doing it. Yeah, give it up. It's going to be good. It's going to be real good because she has not quit. She keeps on and on. This is good. So this is what happens when you don't quit. You have a talent. You have a gift. You have an ability. You have something you're better than 10,000 other people at. Please don't stop. Please don't quit. So rule number one of breaking through averages, don't quit. Become a person who just doesn't stop. Crash through your quitting points. Shoot and strike and do not quit until the Lord tells you. That's rule number one. That's last week's sermon. Number two, you got to choose how you see yourself. It's a life metaphor. How do you see yourself? What words do you ta attach to yourself? Loser, quitter, average those things, those labels you put on yourself, please take all those off. And just for a minute, could you suspend all those labels, please? And let me help you find a better label, a better metaphor for your life. Because you will live up to or down to the metaphor you have in your life. You will live up to or down to the vision you have for who you are. I want to give you something to live up to and not down to. Okay? So let's fix our metaphors. Let's fix our metaphors. You see, your met metaphor packs a punch and it serves as kind of a predictor of how you're going to live your life. Your metaphor is a thermostat. And whatever metaphor you've chosen will set the thermostat of your life. It will set your life at average, below average, above average. You must choose. And guess what? You get to choose. I know for some of you, you were given labels when you were young. You were given these metaphors when you were young and they're hard to remove. But we've got to take some of that goo remover stuff and we've got to remove all the residue of that label. We've got to get all of it off of you. We've got to pull the label off. We've got to get all that off by the power and the grace of the Holy Spirit and Jesus. I'm asking you today to take off all the little labels that you've been given, all the little metaphors, all the little ways you've seen your life. You see, Irwin McManus, part of why I like reading him is because he and I are similar. I love metaphors. I love stories. I love pictures, word pictures. He's great at word pictures. This word picture he uses in the introduction to the book. He says this, Life is a series of challenges, adventures, and yes, battles. 
There will always be giants to subdue and dragons to slay. I have already decided to die with my sword in my hand. There is more courage in us than danger ahead of us. You are strong enough for the battles ahead. He had me at that phrase. Once I got to that point in the book, I'm like, this is my book. This is my book. Love this book. And that's why I wanted you to love this book because I think it will give you power. Change to that. You see the, the power of that? If you see life as a series of challenges, adventures, and yes, battles, that's different than the Eeyore metaphor. Life is just hard. It's always cloudy. I don't like my life. Nobody likes me. I don't like anybody else. You can Eeyore your way through life, right? And some of you are doing that right now. Because your metaphor is all messed up. Life is just hard. Just a mess. I mean, and if you, yes, I know some of you, gosh, dudes, you, some of you have these amazingly difficult, hard stories. And you have people that messed up your young life. And, and, they, and they treated you bad. And they gave you bad labels. And they didn't give you good examples. And Lord have mercy. I have a good friend whose mom didn't even care for him. She was so drug addicted and strung out. She didn't care for him at all. This child, when he was three and four years old, had to fight for every bit of existence. He had every morsel of food he had. He had to find for himself. Dang, that's hard. But if he was standing right here to me, in front of me today, I would say the same thing to him. Dude, I know it was hard. I know you got bad labels. But friend, you are an adult now. It's time to choose your own label. It's time to choose your own path. Stop living in the past. Look forward. Turn around and face the future. Write a better story for your life ahead. Stop living in the past and turn and face your future with a better metaphor. And then things begin to change. So friends, let's get a better metaphor for our lives. The metaphor he uses, challenges, adventures, and battles. Those are good things. I love to use the word adventure and journey when I'm talking about how I relate to Jesus because it means there's going to be ups and downs and twists and turns and sometimes you've got to cross rivers and sometimes you've got to fight some battles and sometimes you go through peaceful times. And, but man, choose your metaphor carefully. So it would be important to know what the greatest teacher, the ruler of the universe said about metaphors, what he called us, wouldn't it? If Jesus called us something, do you imagine it might be true? If Jesus labels you something, might it be true? Jesus knows you. He created you. He created me. He knows us, and he knows what word picture, pictures will help us. He knows what metaphors. Here are some metaphors that Jesus used in his teachings throughout Scripture. He calls us brothers and sisters. He calls us apostles. That is, people who start things. He calls us servants. He calls us chosen. Think of that. The God of the universe has chosen you. Listen to me now. The God of the universe has chosen you. He's chosen you. I know you feel forgotten sometimes by other people. But the people around you are broken. They're not God. Please accept God's label and reject other people's labels. He calls us workers. He says, he says that we are, that we're salt or halos, we're fishermen, we're friends, we're guests of the bridegroom, we're a branch, a branch, <laughs> like on a vine, you're a branch, I'm the vine and you're the branches, remember you, if you stay connected to me, you're going to bear a lot of fruit, he calls us disciples and witnesses, managers, um, he calls us light, that's the word phos, Jesus said, you're foes, you're light for the world. He says we're shepherds, and he says we're sheep. Have you ever been both at the same time? You felt like a sheep, and you felt like a shepherd? Well, the reality is, is there's a lot of multiple meanings to this, isn't there? He says we're seeds. He says we're soil. I missed one a while back. He says we're soil. But you know my favorite one? My favorite one, this is my favorite one. He says you're a child. A child. But not just any ordinary child. He says you are a, you are a child of the most high God. 
How about that? If you were a child of a great king, would you have some privileges and benefits? Yes or no? Okay, let's, let me ask you that again. If you were a child of a great king, would you have some privileges and benefits? Yes or no? Yes. If you were a child of the of, of king of the universe who has control of everything, would you have some features and benefits to being a child of that king? Yes or no? Yes. You got it right. Who said that? Absolutely. See, that's the right answer. Absolutely. You've got amazing things that God wants to do in you, for you, and through you because you are a child of the Most High God. This is great news. So if you've seen yourself as less than that, if your metaphor for life has been different than that, if you've been wearing a label that's smaller than that, your price tag is far greater than you thought. Jesus Christ bought that label for you. But what's amazing is God will allow you to accept it or reject it. Is that crazy? The God, the God, the God of the universe, he doesn't make you take the label. He says it's available. Here's the label I want you to have. You are my child, child of the most high king, the God of the universe. And I want to give you the keys to the kingdom. I want to unleash what I want to do in you, for you, and through you. Please let me be your father with all that that means. Would you do that today? Would you do that today? Here's a passage where Jesus uses three different metaphors to describe us. He says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? So he says, we're halos or salt. It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. Phos, you are phos of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. To put your light under a bowl is to be average. To break through average, to break the law of average is to let your light shine. So what's it going to be? What will you do? Will you shine in a dark world even if it's unpopular? What metaphor will you use from this moment forward to describe your life? What metaphor, what image, what word picture are you going to use to describe your life? Listen to me. For some of you, it's never occurred to you that this is a choice. But friends, it is a choice. You have a choice to make about what metaphor you will use for how you're going to live your life. Choose this carefully because you will live into the metaphor that you've chosen. Your life will take the shape, the characteristics of the metaphor that you choose. Do not choose too small. Do not accept a label that's average. Accept only a label intended for you by God himself as your father, provider, creator, designer, and the one who wants to bless you as a child of his. Don't take any label that's smaller than that. Third thing, breaking the law of average. You got to repent of being a solo act. You don't do this sort of life. You don't do a life that changes the world. You don't do a life that brings your best gifts to the world by yourself. You simply can't do it by yourself. We weren't designed to do it by ourselves. We were designed to do it with God as the power source within and with friends for the journey around us. Jesus constantly talks about our relationship with the Father and our relationship with other people. We were born for a relationship with God and with other people. It's both. You need friends for the journey, and we need Jesus Christ as a power source for this sort of life. Mark 1 17, Jesus says this. And I, I chose this specifically out of the King James Version. He says it this way And Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. Now listen to that. I want you to listen to the verse again. Come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. I like that construction there. I will make you to become. You see, when you treat life as a do-it-yourself project, it's just up to you and how hard you work and what you do, it won't 
work. We don't have the power to overcome like we could. But when you bring Jesus into the middle of it, when you allow him to be your label maker and your provider and your power source, then everything changes. Make sense? You with me? You, you hear what I'm saying? So bring Jesus Christ into the middle. To believe in Jesus is yes to say a prayer and yes to be baptized. Yes, I believe those things, but it is to go further. And to believe him is to say, yes, Jesus, I take you as my source. I take you as my life source. I take you as my label maker. I take you as my designer. I take you as my map maker. I take you as my light and my lamp. You take Jesus as your source. You take him as the one who's going to take you along the, the way. You see, you break the law of average. You break the law of average by joining an epic venture with Jesus as your shepherd and source. Right? Those three things. Stop quitting. Choose a better metaphor. And accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior with all of the benefits of being a child of God on a grand adventure with a Father who loves you more than you can imagine. These are the keys to being above average. And don't you want to be above average? Would you pray with me? So Father, right now, I have friends who need to make an important decision of what label they're going to wear out of this building, of whose child they're going to be, of whether they will trust you and believe you, of whether they will accept you for all that you want to do in them and for them and through them. So God, I know right now a lot's at stake. Not just their own lives, but the lives of those that they love. So, Father, help us to surrender our wills to your will, our ways to your way, our path to your path. Help us to take off our little labels and live into bigger label, labels that you want to give us. Now keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed and let me just say something to you. Please just trust me for just a moment. I know that you would be tempted to leave here with the same label you came in with. I know you might think you can just do this on your own, but I promise you, you can't. If you know that today is a day you need to allow Christ to become the focal point and your power source, and you're saying today, man, I'm going to step into that kind of life. I want to accept Christ with all he wants to give me. Without letting anybody else know, would you just raise your hand so I can just pray for you? Would you just raise your hand where you are? Just let me see your hand. Okay. Now put your hands down. For those of you who raised your hand, listen to me now. I want to talk to you. I want to spend some time with you. Our team wants to help you. Would you just maybe complete that connect card and just say, need an appointment with Jeff, and it, it just, just let our team help you. Or, you know, today, just say, I accepted Christ today. I want to know what's next. Would you let us help you with that? We would love to do that. Please let us do that. Now, when we head into this time of communion that's coming next, if you want to come talk to me, I'm going to be available. I'm just going to sit up here on the edge of the stage. And if you want to talk, then we'll talk. We'll pray together. I'll be here for you. Today is your breakthrough day. Now, Jesus, carry us along in your name. Amen. Now you can look at me for just a moment. We're coming to a time of communion. You see, Jesus wants to do all this for you, in you, for you, and through you. He wants to give you all these things. There are four tables across the front. There are tables for communion. You might call it Lord's Supper or Eucharist. There's a wafer and juice at each table that reminds us that Jesus' body was broken. His blood was shed. The Holy Spirit has been unleashed on the planet to give you a life like none other. And every time we come to these tables, we remember what God wants to do. So you come if you're a follower of Jesus. Or maybe today you decided, I'm following Jesus today. These are your tables if you want to come. I'll bless this time. 
If you want to come, you come. If you want to sit, you sit. You do what you need to do to do business with God. That's what this time's about. Father, thank you for these tables. Help us to hear from you clearly in Jesus' name.